I would choose three words to describe uh, foray music. But of course, there are many others that could describe it. Um, the great philosopher Vladimir Yankelevich, who was obsessed by foreign music and wrote wonderful things about him, he, he actually even chose one single word. So I would keep it in my free. Uh, it's the word charm. And I like this word because it, the charm in French, it also means a spell, you know. And it's not only like being charming, no, it's also a spell to be uh, under a spell, almost under a curse, I would say. And there is this in the foreign music. It's not only uh, gentle, light, and you know, this music that was performed uh, in the private, private houses of these uh, poets and uh, intellectuals and sponsors and uh, the, the high society of Paris in the 19th century. There is also a charm, like with the French signification, also many meanings of the word, that is like almost a state of trance, almost being under a spell. And this you can, you can hear it in many pieces of the Fauré piano music. Uh, this would be my first word. I would also choose the word intimate. Because this is not the music, this is not the most spectacular, uh, spectacular music you would hear. It's not like Liszt, it's not like Rachmaninoff, it's not a bombastic concert piano music. It's wonderful when played in concert, but it invites you in, a, in an inner world. You are invited to get closer and closer. It's not just sending you like fireworks on your face. It doesn't come to you. It invites you to come to it. And this is why I would choose the word intimate. It's speaking to our guts, but really like the very deep part of, of our guts and our mind and our heart. So, I already told the third word, which would be depth. It's incredibly deep music. Um, and this is funny because um, I think that Fauré has a reputation, once again, like of a composer, rather light, writing some little pieces. He didn't write big symphonies. It's true that his way of orchestrating, like his big pieces, are, is quite light. But regarding the piano music, the dynamic range is, is huge. You can really go from pianissimo to like loud explosions of sound and crazy dissonant things, you know. So the depth is, uh, is really uh, probably the most important word because when I go for playing something, I really need, I really need that it talks to the deepest sides of my, of my own being. I cannot just play, I cannot just stay on the surface. I need to really dive into it. And this is the same about like the, the, the artists I love to listen to. They are divers, they are not swimmers. They are not just on the surface of things, they just dive into the things, whatever happens, like taking risks. And this also um, motivated me to record for a music because I said, I feel some kind of misunderstanding, like it has to be played, you know, in a like polite way, let's say. Uh, I cannot bear it. I see passion in this music. I see violence in this music, even in the softest moments. You can really have something almost scary if you listen to this. here we don't know and we want to know more and for me as a performer I cannot dream of something better opening a piece starting to play it and feeling where does it go and this is the feeling I'm looking at after when I'm playing even a piece I know very well I want to play it and discover it when I'm playing it and I I was not aware of this dimension of foray piano music because most of the times when I heard it, like a few, a few bits of it, like here in the radio or something, I could not identify this quality of this music. 
But this is incredibly deep and sometimes even savage and wild music. So I wanted to explore that dimension. It may please people, some people and please some others, but this is my way. There are many things that make this music remarkable. Um, I train myself as a composer. Um, it's difficult for me because um, the composition process is extremely challenging. Because for me it's directly related to music writing. I make actually a difference between composition and music writing. But for me, composition depends on music writing. I will make it a bit, I will develop this. Composition, basically you can do whatever you want. If you want to write a cluster, if you want to, if you have this idea or that idea, you can do whatever you want. Music writing is different. Music writing is getting to know the language of music. The, langu the language of music can be summed up very easily <laughs> like this. or in minor mode. And from all these little progressions, this actually is the key to all the music that was written from the 17th century to the first half of 20th century. Then there are many composers, many styles, many approaches, but this is the key. And this is the music writing starts from here. How can you make this very simple combination of chords, entertaining, more complex and dramatic. And this is what the history of Western music is about. How actually the composers, they developed progressively the instrumental music. Because for a long time music was related to religious purposes or uh, singing, dancing. It was hard for the, music, for the instrumental music to stand on its own. And the, for me, the real history of Western music is about that, is actually how the instrumental music gets free progressively. And it got free thanks to this magic of this simple progression. How Mozart, how Beethoven, they developed it, and then all the great composers of 19th century and beginning of 20th century. And I made all this introduction to talk about Faure's own approach of music writing because I am obsessed myself by that. And the pieces I choose to play uh, as a performer are obviously pieces that are really dealing with these requirements of the music writing. Because to make it work, you need to learn a lot of things and you need to master a lot of very sensitive things. It's very technical. Faure was an absolute master at music writing. Uh, from his first years already, the cont contrapoint, contrapoint and uh, the voicing and how actually he masters the harmony, even in his first pieces that were less personal probably than the last ones. He manages to, he, he has a mastering, a craftsmanship for music writing that is unbelievable. Um, but this would not be enough because it's not enough to be just a master at music writing to touch the heart of people and be a great musician. So what I find, find the most remarkable in Faure piano music is that he manages to make the, his incredible mastery of music writing to serve a real musical purpose. And this is the hard thing. This is how you combine your knowledge of music writing together with a great inspiration. It's not enough to be just inspired without technical clues. And it's not enough to be just technically a master. You need to combine both. And this is for me what makes a great composer. And to be honest, I was not expecting Faure to be such a great composer. But going through his old pieces, I was just amazed by the level of music writing together with the inspiration. What the music of Faure means for me, uh, this is a question in, um, 
in constant progress, I would say, because I continue to discover, I continue to discover things, and my life is changing, and when my life is changing, my approach to music is changing as well, and when my approach of music is changing, my life is changing as well. I'm, I'm so much intoxicated by music that actually it all goes together. And when I started recording these complete works, I was a different man than I am now. I started to work on this recording three years ago. And now I would play it completely differently, probably. Uh, that's what makes things hard, because when you record, like even like complete works, it's just like a statement. So I was conscious that I was making the statement, my statement about this music in 2020, 2021. Uh, and it had to work as something that could be listened to like years after. So that's why I was talking about like a sculpture of sound. This is, this was made at this moment of my life with, with my, the sensitivity I had with this music at that very moment. But already now, like a few years after, I would not play the same. <laughs> so the meaning of uh, for a music for me, it has, it has, I would say that this music has reached a very deep room in my being. Uh, I question it. I, I'm still thinking about this. The, the, the composer side of me is asking this room, the, the foray presents in this room like many questions, and the performer side as well. How to make it? I'm obsessed as a performer about making things clear. And foreign music, especially the late years music, is very hard to make clear. Even when you understand it, like musically, when you study how it's written, how it works harmonically, it doesn't mean that when you perform it, it will be 100% clear, crystal clear for the listener. So I'm still asking myself, and now I perform some of the pieces in concert, and some listeners are very... They, they are a bit upset because they don't get, they don't understand it. And then it's my turn to be upset because then I think, oh, I still have work. <laughs> and you know, um, I think actually that this music is probably easier to approach uh, in recording, studio recording mode than for a concert because it's very intimate, uh, it's very special how uh, how you can invite the listeners, the, the audience, to actually really dig with you in this music in a concert mode is still challenging for me. Not all the pieces. There are pieces that I play from Foray and they, they make their way through the heart of the listener. It works. But some of the pieces written in the, in the late years, uh, it seems complicated. So there are two things. Of course, I need to play it more. And I would love other pianists to play it more, so then the audience get more, gets more used to the language. But also I'm thinking, oh, I still have so, some work to make it more clear. So then it has more chance to reach the heart of the listener from first listening. There's a very passionate question about how the life and the works of an artist are connected together. And I could not answer straight to that question. My opinion is constantly changing about it because I would love to see what happened to a composer, for example, by playing one of his pieces, but it's not so easy. Just think about Mozart. He wrote these two piano concertos like Köchel uh, 488 and Köchel 491 almost at the same time, A major and C minor. And if you listen to it, and then you listen to the next one. With the piano, which is so dark and sad compared to this. What was he going through in his life at that moment? How can someone guess? 
because these pieces are so contrasted. And with all great composers, it's pretty much the same. Uh, if you think about Faure, for example, in his middle creative period, he wrote two masterpieces, but they are so different from each other. The fifth Barcarolle and the sixth Nocturne. If you hear, for example, the sixth Nocturne, this is a world of pe very peaceful world, like after a quest, finally finding yourself. Finding yourself, getting in peace with all your inner demons. And how can you imagine that he wrote it exactly at the same time in the same summer that he wrote the fifth Barcarolle that is so tormented, so full of rage and violence? compare this outburst to how can you guess it's the same man at the same moment of his life who wrote it but now um, I can develop an, another subject because this is the middle style of Fauré creativity let's say it's the pieces written in the middle of his life he was around 45 and uh, it's Opus 66, Opus 70. Um, but it's very different from the style of the pieces he wrote at the beginning of his life. And very different from the pieces he wrote in the late years of his life. For example, one of the greatest pieces he wrote in his early years is the great ballad um, for piano. And here you can find some innocence, a simple love for the world and the nature, um, a pleasure to make the piano sing very naturally. So this has nothing to do with what you just heard before. And it has even less to do with a late piece like the second prelude, for example. With this incredible ending. Nothing to do with what you heard just before. If you listen carefully, read carefully the music, of course you can recognize Fauré's signature. But at first listening, it's not so much possible, even though some of these pieces are in the same key. For example, this is... And the great fifth Barcarolle. <laughs> is in the same key than the ballad.
but it's impossible to actually connect these pieces together when you discover them at the beginning. But then when you explore, when you know more, uh, when you get more familiar with foray music, you see some connections, actually. You see some connections and you see that he, he was specially attracted by some keys. For example, this F sharp, ma major, minor, he loved it, and the D flat. He loved these keys very much. You have um, uh, several pieces written in these keys and, they, uh, and there are some connections between them. What I like is also to see like some, some of these connections like very subtle, but they are here. For example, the first Barcarolle. Here there is something wonderful. And this is actually a signature of the greatest composers because there is like a mistake that he transforms into a genius musical idea. I mean, if I play this, <laughs> you're not so happy, right? But if I play... Then it becomes something. And actually, this is the first Barcarolle, but in the ninth Barcarolle in the same key, what does he do? So he just makes a little <laughs> sign of hand to the old to the to the young man that he was and now rewriting a barcarolle in the same key and reusing the same idea <laughs> of this. So I, this is this is things that th these are things that you only notice when you start really digging in the pieces and getting familiar with them, and then you see how the composer was playing with himself, with the younger version of himself, the older version of himself, and all all the kind of beings of all age they communicate with each other in the single corpus of this piano music. So I find it fantastic, and this is one of the most exciting things when recording the complete works of Fauré. There are a lot of tricks that Fauré uses in his music. Uh, what, one can identify them as a signature, but it's not completely correct because other comp composers use the same tricks. But Fauré had his own way of using them. One of these tricks is playing with the leading note. Fauré likes to somehow, it's a friend, composer of mine, who, who calls it that way, like to kill the leading note. So for example, if we are in A flat major, the leading note would be the G, natural G. And we need this for the resolution, for the re release of the tension. If you hear this, you want it to go up to... Fauré likes to kill it, and he would do... He will play with this. Because this note is rather going down. This we are used to it. Like. Yes? So natural G, G flat. And Fauré will play with this. I like to, to remind like what Chesterton and what Borges, you know, they're, they're wonderful writers. And in some of their texts, they think that actually. Uh, all literature can be summed up as a great detective novel. So you have like a little clue, a little hint, or a little mistake somewhere. And then you take it, and then progressively, if you follow it, it can unveil some things progressively. But sometimes it's hard to get it from first reading. And I, I like to relate Forrest's music with this actually detective story approach. Because in many pieces, with this playing on the leading note, it, it brings some mistakes somewhere and then it captivates the ear and then it will, it will actually answer to your expectations in another unexpected way but that will release the tension created by the mistake, so-called mistake. For example, the very first piece uh, that got published uh, for piano is the first romance in A flat major. You have this play on the leading note.
beautiful, but there is a mistake here. Normally, it would go that way, if Faure was not a genius, let's say. <laughs> We are in A flat major, so naturally the G has to be a natural G. Okay? If it goes flat, it's to go down to D flat major. But here Fauré plays with the leading, leading note. And this is the unexpected harmony that creates shape. Without that, it would be random music, but thanks to that, it becomes genius music. There are other, other tricks that then some uh, composers were, some other great composers were very attracted by, is the use of the modes. So for example, uh, the, the mode is actually a scale, but not the diatonic scale we are used to, not like a, a mode will create some accidents in the scale. So the little normal process of releasing a musical tension will be a bit different. For example, it could be the same progression will be colored differently and Fauré likes to use it. For example, in one of his most famous pieces This arrival of the F sharp in the end is magic. Why? Because before that we were we were in the mode of D flat with with E natural, F natural. So we cannot expect the F sharp. And then he, how to say? He keeps it for the very end to make the whole phrase magical, you know. And this, of course, other great composers we remember about it, like Ravel, for example, you know, how it is with the, um, for example, here. Um, It's the same magic in the end. You were in minor. So, actually, Ravel was a student of Fauré. He might have taken a bit of this smell of this harmonic language using these modes. So, this is also a Fauré signature, but uh, unfortunately, this signature got more famous thanks to Ravel and Debussy than from Fauré himself, introducing it in the French piano music. Uh, another thing I, I noticed in, a, in his late piano music is an interval, the third, the minor third, or a third put into like uh, minor keys. In the three last nocturnes, you hear it. The eleventh, for example. the 12th nocturne. Like a... And in the last nocturne. And this exists also in his chamber, in his late chamber music. It's like this interval 
I don't know how it makes one other one other person than me feel like, but for me, it's just like leaving the battle. Having lost the battle, having lost everything, and farewell to life, farewell to friends, farewell to love. Just this is the end. I would say that with this very interval, it's like destroying hope. But then, of course, Forêt will develop the piece and bring some other light to this, like create some hope. But I feel like this interval is really like, ah, such a heavy farewell to life. I was enjoying life, but now it's my time to leave. So this is one of the little musical signatures I find in his late works. There are many challenges in for a music, for a pianist. Um, of course, all the technical ones. This music is technically very demanding. Uh, there is a lot to play with both hands. It's not only the right hand having virtuosic stuff, also the left hand has a lot to play. Like in the, the hardest pages of Liszt and Chopin. But the other challenge is that you cannot just let yourself explode with this music. Um, this, its kind of virtuosity is, stands on its own. It's here to serve a musical purpose that has nothing to do with the list, for example. Uh, it's more intimate, even when it gets like crazy. It remains uh, somehow intimate and you cannot just let yourself go. Because also this music is full of hidden voices, of nice uh, counterpoint. For example, I think about, now spontaneously, I, found, I think about some of the canons uh, that Faure likes to put in his music. You know, he was obsessed by music writing. And uh, some of the greatest tricks about music writing is how to, to play with voices and to do like canonic things. Imi like imitations and things like this. And for example, in the ninth Barcarolle, a bit before the culmination, the theme Forêt likes it to This is very simple. You can hear the canon, but what is, makes it hard is that actually you have also all these 16 notes. So there is kind of a flow that you cannot lose. You cannot just enjoy yourself playing the canon and just listening to it. You have all these 16 notes and they have somehow to be naturally played because they are responsible for the harmony, they are responsible for the rhythmical pace. And you have a, a lot of things like that in forest music, which is extremely complicated to put together. <laughs> and you have, of course, this uh, wonderful valse caprice. There are four of them and they are probably the most uh, brilliant, like the most, uh, how to say, extrovert uh, sides of uh, foray music for piano. And you have this, uh, here is more explosive virtuosity, but still it's very tight. You have really to, to fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> you cannot just let go. see that there are a lot of things uh, that are very like on a, from a strictly technical point of view that are very challenging but what is complicated is to keep the melody and to play with all these voicings that in foray music are particularly um, intricate, like particularly chromatic and not easy to just listen and put together it, just straight you you really have to spend time and to really master um, the written, like the, how to say, the root of the score. But um, 
what I would say is also very challenging about this music is um, what to do with the dynamics. Because this is one of the most important things about interpretation. There is not just one piano, one forte. There are several ones, and there are several ones for each composer. How Fauré uses the piano dynamic is not the same as an, another composer. And it depends also on the context of the piece. Um, there are some, the, for example, if I take, uh, what, what piece can I take? For example, uh, um, the fourth Barcarolle. <laughs> This is a piano, and it's not the same piano. It's written piano the same way, but it's not the same piano than here. So you have also to find the, how to say, the color range or the spectrum of Fauré dynamics related to the context, related to the, to the key, related to the atmosphere of a piece, which is the case for every composer. But with Fauré, I would say, it, if you put all things together, this extreme virtuosity, like digitality, like the, the finger work, and if you have also to, to concentrate on the counterpoint and to care about the dynamics and how it goes together with all that, it makes it ex extremely challenging. It, in a way, you know, I, I, I would not say that, how, how to say that? Um, uh, it's the case for all the composers. But one of the challenges about the foreign music is that it's not so much performed. With many composers, we have the opportunity to listen to many recordings. There were a lot of studies made about interpretation. And with foreign music, we don't have that much. So there is a big work. Uh, it's, it's a lot of responsibility for the performer to actually do this research. That with some composers, for example, if you want to play Chopin, for me, I would do this research also for Chopin even if he's very famous and we have many versions, I would still look for dynamics, continue thinking about how to play this music. But let's say that if you are a pianist and you want to play Chopin, it's easier because you have already things in ears. You can play like this. Me, I would not go for this simple way. <laughs> I would also look for another one. If it's easy to play that way, I would look for the more difficult way. <laughs> uh, but with Fauré, it's really... I, I had the, 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 almost the physical impression when performing this music in concert and uh, in the studio, I had the impression of visiting uh, a completely unknown territory. And this is a fantastic sensation, I have to say. Um, I would encourage all the musicians to look for these unknown fields and to create their own musical garden in these fields not just to look for the things that were explored thousands of times, which is, it's nice as well. For me, it's worth it only if you bring your own research there. But really to visit also some territories that were not explored, not so much explored or not explored at all. It's absolutely fantastic. And uh, I, I would not leave it uh, in a, it's, it's a big, big part of my musical, of my musical way. And uh, I need somehow to colonize all these spaces and uh, and it's extremely motivating I would say uh, it's challenging and motivating because then you cannot only just go for a you know like ask a teacher or ask a specialist of this or that how how can this be played you have somehow to to look yourself to dig yourself in that stuff and this responsibility this independence of mind that you need to go in these empty or unknown territories is one for me of the key qualities of an artist, how actually one artist deals with, with, with that dimension, you know, because uh, this is something I, I, would, um, uh, I would say for myself, it, it's not like, I would not pretend it's true, it's just my, one of my statements about my, my work with music is that um, the contrary of art for me is, no, not the contrary of art, but let's say imitating is not sufficient. Uh, imitation can 
can, have, can play a role in the way you learn things, in, you, in the way you get familiar with some things. As a dancer, you can imitate a move. As a filmmaker, you can imitate the way one filmmaker you like very much edited, how, how he deals with the rhythm of the pictures, or with a composer or with a musician, the way, uh, the way he plays, how, how he manages to play forte, how he manages to do the legato. You can be inspired by that. You can even imitate just to get closer to that. But this is not sufficient. This is not enough. Uh, for me, any um, artistic um, involvement is about creativity. And creativity is not imitation. Creativity is not just even like talking about a performer. It's not only playing a piece. It's not playing the way you were told or the way you heard this person play it. When you play a piece for me, you have somehow to recreate it. And it's not only just depending on, uh, on, on your own like spontaneity and how you feel like that day. No, it's actually a research work. You have to look for things in, your, in the score to build an interpretation that makes sense, but that would explore ways that then makes the listener arrive in a place that would be like this unknown place I was talking about, even with the pieces that the people know. And this is what I'm looking for as a performer. I think that in the Forest music, there is a lot to take away for the listener. Um, I, it, it's complicated to, to just um, expect anything from the listener similar to what I feel myself with this music, because now this music is a big part of my life. I, it accompanies me, I, it's really close to my heart, and uh, I have a relationship with it as like if I were carrying some sort of being inside of my own being, um, a living one, a living being, not only just like, you know, like a archive, or something I would... Uh, no, no, it's, it's really something uh, living and something that has also... The, that changes, the colors of it are changing, the, the feelings I have connected to it are changing also. The music of Forêt is really, yeah, like a living being with its moods. Um, my hope uh, with this recording is that the listeners can really discover something. It might not be the whole set of pieces, maybe just one. I would love the listeners just to pick one piece and maybe just one moment of a piece that would reach their heart and stay there. And then maybe from this they could have the chance to pull the string from that and open other dimensions of the foray music to explore more. It's only about them, you know, the listener Listeners, they do whatever they want with what they listen to. They can listen to music to relax. They can listen to music because they, they listen to it as, a, as an emotional journey. And they really listen carefully to it as an emotional journey with all feelings getting involved. Or they could even be interested about it, like being really passionate about classical music and trying to, to see how this music could be connected to some other music they already know. Uh, to include it in their musical landscape. So there are many ways of listening to it. You can listen to it more intellectually, more physically, but I really hope that uh, this recording won't be just like a dead item, you know, like something like, okay, yeah, another recording, another uh, foray recording. I would really like to, to tease the listener's curiosity with this recording and maybe to make it, to hopefully, to make the listener discover things that he was not expecting from Fauré or from music in general. Because I think that there are really a lot of original things, there are a lot of things in this music that you cannot find anywhere else. Uh, Fauré was not a revolutionary, or if he was a, re a revolutionary, he was a soft one. It's a revolution of delicacy, let's say, or subtlety. It's not like banging on the table 
like Schoenberg did, like Debussy or Bartok did, you know, like let's make modernity. Fauré has some aspects in his music that are very modern, uh, how he uses harmony, for example, but he did it softly. And I like it. I like the idea of being a soft re revolutionary. Um, so m probably for the music lovers, he will never stand as a pillar in the history of music as someone, as a game changer, let's say. Fauré was not a game changer. He was a changer maybe of his own game as an artist. And this is what I, like, what I would like to share to make the listener feel closer to this man and realize that he was a great composer. Not only a composer who did some nice things in a time where there were other geniuses that made much nicer things, but who realized that he really managed to create his own musical world with all the emotions you can imagine in his own language. <laughs> 